The Clone Wars. From its humble beginnings as a throwaway line in the original trilogy, all the way to having well over a hundred TV episodes centered entirely around it. It describes a place in the storyline that, despite being just a fucking side note wedged between two movies, has undoubtedly grown to contribute the most lore, world building, and beloved characters to the world of Star Wars since its very inception in the 70s and 80s. Sure, I was very much a prequel kid, but I'd wager that I am not alone when I say that the Clone Wars era of Star Wars is my absolute favorite era in the entire saga. And it all started for me with one series. The original animated Clone Wars micro-series made by the legendary Gendy Tartakovsky. The creator of my favorite show of all time, Samurai Jack. The 2003 Clone Wars micro-series, not to be confused with its much longer running successor helmed by Dave Filoni, which was also a pretty huge part of my childhood, was a 2D animated cartoon that aired short, bite-sized Clone Wars stories from November 2003 all the way up to March 2005. Just a couple months before the release, of Revenge of the Sith. This year, in fact, more accurately, the end of this year, marks the 20th anniversary of its initial airing. It's a show that means so much to me, and with it officially turning 20 fucking years old, I decided to revisit it. And I can honestly say it not only still holds up, it is nothing short of amazing. Just like my other recap review style videos, I will be going through the entire series to serve as a recap while also pointing out my thoughts, my opinions, comparisons to the other Clone Wars, and finally ending up back here for my final thoughts. So you know, spoilers ahead for a nearly 20 year old miniseries that is tragically no longer canon, but absolutely well worth the watch. Without further ado, let's jump right into one of the most underrated pieces of Star Wars media known to man. The masterpiece that is Gendy Tartakovsky's Clone Wars. This series wastes absolutely no time jumping right into the action. With mere seconds between the end of the intro and Yoda igniting his lightsaber instantly materializing an entire goddamn battle around him. A conflict containing ground combat, aerial combat, absolutely no shortage of explosions, and what seems like literally thousands of fighters on either side waging war with each other. Perfectly highlighting right out the gate what I believe to be two of the strongest aspects of this series. The pacing and the scale. Now if it's a bit confusing why I'm already diving into these aspects of the show, first off I'm just pretty fucking excited. I'm like a kid during show and tell and I sure brought my favorite little Star Wars cartoon. But also I think it's somewhat important to discuss these two points early on because they go hand in hand with what this show from a creative perspective set out to accomplish. And ultimately the reason why Daddy George greenlit it in the first place. There's a very cool special feature connected to this that I definitely encourage you watch sometime called Bridging the Saga. It's got a ton of behind the scenes info on the production for any fellow animation nerds like me but also has a handful of amazing interviews with the people that made it. One of those people just so happened to be the man himself, George Lucas, who opens the feature stating the core mission statement of this cartoon. It's here purely to show us the Clone War, the war we would have otherwise not seen at all between movies. And even more importantly, show us how truly action-packed and incredibly vast it was. Which brings us right back to the show. The first line of dialogue we hear is from Yoda, saying, Like fire across the galaxy, the Clone Wars spread. And we then see just that. Conflicts on a handful of different planets, most of which we get to revisit in later shorts. We are told how many planets have already fallen into alliances with the terrible Count Dooku, we get to see some more clone troopers be the baddest motherfuckers around, as clones tend to do. And we get our introduction to our main boys, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker. Master and Padawan respectively, and members of the Jedi Order. Quick cut to a meeting in Chancellor Palpatine's office. In this meeting, Yoda, Obi-Wan, and Palpatine are discussing a planet named Munalist. 
a planet that is home to the intergalactic banking clan, officially sided with the Separatist army, and currently producing a fuck ton of droid soldiers with every passing minute. Obi-Wan expresses his concern and volunteers himself and his men to haul ass the fuck over there, and in Fortnite terms, clutch an epic victory royale for the Republic. Palpatine, who like many of the characters in this adaptation, has a pretty interesting and hilarious design. Basically says, hell yeah, do that, and also bring that little chosen one of yours, he's pretty good at flying shit and whatnot. Yoda and Kenobi immediately protest giving a Padawan command of the Space Forces in an attack like this, but are instantly overruled by Mr. President over here. As the troops load up, Obi-Wan looks on in disbelief that this is what it's come to, and Anakin hops in his Jedi Starfighter, a ship that looks about a million times more badass than that yellow one he has in canon now. While taking off, he levels the ship with a window of a building, so we can say goodbye to Padme Amidala. They have a pretty emotional moment through these two layers of glass. They say the only goodbye they are able to with the haste of the situation. And the camera then fixes itself behind Padme as we see the mass amounts of ships leaving for battle. And that's episode one. At least... I think it is. <laughs> we need to quickly discuss the whole episode structure of this series because it is a bit confusing. Ultimately, there were three seasons total. Seasons one and two consist of 20 short three minute episodes which were compiled together as a volume one. While season three consists of five more normal 12 minute episodes which were compiled as volume two. I am going to go more by volumes instead of seasons, and I will be moving some episodes around a bit to be able to recap it a little more efficiently. Also, I personally never watched it as it aired in episodes. My fondest memories of this series is actually renting it from my local video rental store. Getting volume 1 one week and then volume 2 the next. Anyways, le let's get back on track here. The next episode opens with Obi-Wan addressing a group of ARC troopers, pointing out that they are the most elite the clone army has to offer and are tasked with a special mission. The group of clones are then shown to us, and please, allow me the honor of introducing to you not only one of the best parts of this series, but also one of my favorite things to graze the world of Star Wars. Ladies and gentlemen, the Munalist 10. An elite task force of clones, led by an absolute badass named Commander Fordo, who later ride around in a gunship that looks like this. God, I really wish this shit was still canon. Before the two part ways to command different assaults on this planetary invasion, Obi-Wan and Anakin have a quick heart-to-heart. -heart. And by heart-to-heart, -heart, I mean Anakin whines a bit about Obi-Wan doubting his abilities, and Obi-Wan says that he only questions his maturity, and the decision was out of his hands anyway. The voice actor for Anakin in this series, unlike some of his co-stars like Mr. Johnny Test himself over here, did not end up reprising his role in the later Clone Wars series. I do really love and have endless nostalgia for his successor, but I have to admit, this guy gives off a lot more Hayden Christian vibes, making it sort of more true to the films. But I am the best pilot in the Order. Anyways, the battle commences with Anakin leading the Space Forces as they attack some rather phallic looking space stations, and Obi-Wan along with hundreds of gunships depart to siege the planet's surface. The ARC troopers then break off to commence their own mission, whipping and weaving through the city, only for a lone droid to sprint his ass up some stairs and shoot him down. The pilot remains completely unfazed throughout the entire thing, and all the troops hop out of the crashed gunship as if they didn't just fall out of the fucking sky. But even after that, they cannot catch a break. Fordo quickly hits some wicked gang signs, they use a scanner of some sort to find the snipers and waste no time blowing those motherfuckers up. One of the soldiers even finesses an entire tank, all on his own, on their way to their ultimate goal. This big ass artillery cannon. Which they then overtake and destroy like they're speed running that shit. We then get a bit of a break from the Battle of Munalist and are taken to a water planet called Mon Calamari. There is basically a race war going on between these fish people and these squid people. 
that is also basically a proxy war since these squids are aligned with the droid army for control of the planet and the fish people are aligned with the republic for control of the planet. Pretty insane for a <laughs> completely submerged planet. There's gotta be like crazy limited usefulness for controlling this planet, right? The Republic ends up sending one of my absolute favorite Jedi of all time, and probably the only one that can breathe underwater, Kit Fisto. In this episode, he commands an underwater battle, has a lightsaber that works underwater, somehow. Oh yes, of course, it's because he has two crystals in there. How could I have been so naive? And he most definitely tears some shit up here. Even at one point creating water balls with the force that demolish a massive undersea cannon that was giving them trouble. And then pushes it into a cavern, sending it into what looks like the depths of hell. Okay, back to Munalist. And there sure is a bit of a hiccup in the invasion. The banking clan, who are these uh, handsome Squidward looking motherfuckers, notice that the Republic's firepower is too strong for them to defend against and decide to send in their contingency plan, courtesy of Count Dooku, an armored bounty hunter named Dirge. He promptly mounts his speeder and leads the Star Wars equivalent of a goddamn cavalry charge, which is just outrageously effective. They take out so much shit before on the battlefield coming face to face with Kenobi, who in retaliation was also leading a speeder bike cavalry charge. I guess that's just the strat now. They knock each other off their bikes and Obi-Wan lands a crushing blow to Dirge, which is only met with laughter. This motherfucker delivers a volley of punches and continues to fight with a lightsaber lodged in his chest. Obi-Wan does eventually regain his weapon, fight with him a while longer before chopping him in half and dipping the fuck out of there to meet up with the rest of the troops. Because surely he's down for the count now, right? Yeah. As Kenobi and the Mutalist 10 siege the headquarters of the banking clan, a familiar face busts his way through the window and promptly takes a missile straight to his body, revealing himself to be a veiny tentacle monster. Ugh. He sucks Obi-Wan into himself, devouring him whole, oh god, and is ultimately <laughs> inflated and blown up from within. I feel just as dirty as Obi-Wan looks right now after reading that, trust me. Anyways, the banking clan surrenders, and the Battle of Munalist is just about over. Next up is a very exciting short, it's our first real glimpse into the other side of the war. Also, it begins with one of my favorite clips in the entire show. Count Dooku arrives at a gladiator arena containing a handful of contestants battling to the death. He is greeted by this guy who spits two or so sentences of straight nothing. Count Dooku. Indeed. Dooku sits with the man and watches the battle, revealing to us that this is all set up by Dooku in order to find himself an apprentice. Just then, Dooku feels a disturbance, and the camera pans out to reveal someone else in the chair next to him. He is impressed by her stealth skills, as she had within a moment infiltrated the room and- <laughs> Wait, hold up, where'd that guy go? <laughs> Where the fuck is he? Did, did she- No. Not my favorite little guy. Anyway, she, without a second thought, throws herself in the rat race and literally kills everyone present. If you haven't noticed already, this is Asajj Ventress. You probably know her from her much more prominent role as Dooku's Padawan and her further character development in the other Clone Wars. Dooku applauds her performance, but she then makes the critical error of calling herself a Sith to which Dooku is immediately offended by, enough to literally float his ass down there. Ventress snaps at him for his utter disrespect and attacks, only to immediately get her shit tased like a drunk uncle in Walmart. She wakes up somewhere else an undisclosed amount of time later to find her real test. A short scrimmage with the Count himself, which gives us our first little taste of the amazingly choreographed lightsaber fights this series has to offer. After being put in her place by an actual Sith, she is gifted a new pair of red lightsabers and given a mission from Lord Sidious. Kill Anakin Skywalker. Back to Munalist for pretty much the last time, I promise. 
Nearing the end of the space battle, a lone Separatist ship appears, takes out an entire squadron, and leads Anakin on a wild goose chase to the surface and through the city. Despite Obi-Wan's orders not to, and his warnings that the ship is baiting him, Anakin is dead set on pursuing, because he can sense it's no robot. It's someone or something else. Ventress hits the hyperdrive to another system, and Anakin eagerly follows. The next episode is one of, if not my absolute favorite segment in the series. It takes us to the planet Dantooine, not Tatooine, Dantooine. George Lucas really busted his ass name in that one. The premise of the short is that a small kid who lives on the planet is observing a massive battle. Right in the middle of all the action is Jedi Master Mace Windu. The Separatists deploy this <laughs> kind of funny machine that does this. It's actually really useful here, as it not only instantly crushes anyone caught underneath, but also kicks up waves of dirt, throwing everyone else around. Directly resulting in Mace Windu losing his lightsaber and getting completely surrounded by super battle droids. But for Mace fucking Windu, no lightsaber is no damn problem. He takes on the horde of droids, destroying them in an almost rhythmic and endlessly creative manner. Force pushes, crushes, and can't forget simply beating the shit out of them with his bare ass hands. Hell, there is one point where he uses the force to casually remove every bolt from a droid, letting it just fall apart, and then launches the pieces like a hail of bullets at other droids. If you haven't seen the show for yourself and you don't plan on it, I wholeheartedly suggest at least watching this one short. You'll probably change your mind. The rest of the episode shows Mace finding his lightsaber, single-handedly destroying the machine, and ends with him visiting the boy on the hill. The boy even offers him a drink of water, which is super sweet. Just as that was probably my favorite short, this next one is probably my least favorite. Not because it's bad by any means, just because it's the only one that while revisiting I found I didn't remember at all. Plus it's generally not quite as solid as the others in my opinion. I'm going to go through this one pretty fast, you ready? Jedi Luminara and her Padawan, that bastard traitor from the other Clone Wars, are finishing learning about Kaber crystals in a Kaber crystal cave. When they are attacked by robots that have cloaking technology. Yoda, who is <laughs> on Padme's ship for some reason, senses these two Jedi are in danger and reroutes the ship and sets off to help. Padme, uh... She also wants to go help. She fights with a few of the robots, destroying them by using 3PO as bait. Yoda saves the Jedi off screen, and that's pretty much it. We now finally get to return to Anakin's adventure, which takes up most of the remainder of Volume 1. He lands on the planet that Ventress led him to and begins searching. A group of clones arrive who were sent to back him up, but they aren't very much help as they are all dragged and thrown through the woods, picked off Evil Dead style. Anakin hears one of the clones screaming in pain, which sounds like they fucking did it to the voice actor for real, <laughs> leading him back to the ships just in time to see him get vaporized by an explosion. All the troops and both ships are now gone. It all was a trap. Ventress reveals herself, and an absolutely amazing battle breaks out. I would personally go as far as saying it's one of the best lightsaber duels in any piece of Star Wars media. And I'd go as far as to argue that one of the biggest differences between this and the other Clone Wars, other than the word THE of course, is this incredibly dynamic action on full display here. In the end of this battle, the two find themselves in a dramatic, excellently timed standoff as rain begins to pour down and evaporate with a sizzle off their lightsabers. After some clashes in the dark ruins of an ancient structure, they find themselves on an elevated platform. Anakin has his lightsaber knocked out of his hand. And no, it's not lost on me that this is like the third fucking time I've described a Jedi losing access to his lightsaber. Anyway, it's not a problem since she has two, and sharing is caring, as long as forcibly crushing someone's arm to get them to drop something can be considered sharing. Now taking hold of a red lightsaber, the color of the Sith, and the very same color he is destined to someday ravage the galaxy with, Anakin begins giving in to his rage, 
prompting flashes of Yoda, Qui-Gon, and Obi-Wan to appear with every blow. And these force visions, or whatever they are, seem very concerned, almost scared. The ground, unable to withstand these attacks, breaks beneath Ventress, causing her to fall and, at least within the confines of this show, more than likely die. And that was the plan all along. Sidious said it to Dooku right before she was recruited. She was just a pawn, sacrificed to set into motion the eventual fall of the Jedi. After returning in Ventress's ship, Anakin meets back up with Obi-Wan and apologizes for his naivety. But to Obi-Wan's dismay, remains proud of what he accomplished nonetheless, despite what it took to do so. Just then, they receive an urgent call from a Jedi who asks for immediate evac for his group. He is barely able to warn of a new droid general, a Jedi killer, before he meets his brutal end and the transmission cuts off. We are then, for the very first time, introduced to General Grievous, a very well-known character now. But just a heads up for anyone unfamiliar, this General Grievous is an entirely different beast. I'm sure Gendy and the people making this were definitely working off of early information as General Grievous was yet to make his film debut, but this is not the clunky, cowardly general we know today. This version is nimble, stealthy, and able to hunt Jedi. And that is exactly what happens in Volume 1's final short. In this group, there are multiple Jedi Masters, and this very familiar looking Padawan named Shaggy, who sadly is the first to fall after he fucking snaps and runs out in the open. We then see Grievous easily juggle all the remaining members of the group, fighting multiple Jedi Masters at once, and winning. We then cut to Yoda, who feels a classic disturbance in the Force, and that's Volume 1. Now for Volume 2. Volume 2 is really something special. First, we get some closure on the General Grievous cliffhanger at the end of Volume 1. All the Jedi are pretty much defeated, and only Jedi Master Mundi, Ayla Sakura, and Shakti escape with their lives, thanks to a clutch rescue and extraction from the Munalist 10 and their iconic painted gunship. We are then quickly shown a Force Vision, or Dream, Yoda has, I think. It shows Qui-Gon Jinn urging young Anakin to enter a tree on a swamp planet to face his final test, himself. Paralleling the scene where Yoda sends Luke into a very similar situation in Empire Strikes Back. Immediately cut to a Jedi Council meeting pertaining to the new threat, General Grievous. The notion that more Jedi Knights are needed for this war comes up, and Obi-Wan suggests that in this time of conflict they forgo the trials that Padawans must complete to become Jedi Knights so that they can promote Anakin. He argues Anakin already passed a trial of skill by defeating Ventress, a trial of the flesh when he lost his hand to Count Dooku, and a major test of courage by enduring this war to begin with. The only test he hasn't completed in a way is the test of the spirit. The one that centers around themselves, and likely the quest Qui-Gon sent baby Anakin on in that dream. Despite that, after Anakin has a moment to reunite with Padme for presumably the first time since the start of the war, and also gets to see 3PO's new gold plating, <laughs> the council ultimately decides to do it anyway. They cut off his greasy ass rat tail, which C-3PO must have fucking scrounged around on the floor to retrieve so he can give it to Padme as a keepsake. And then a short time skip happens between segments. The next episode opens on this dude who is absolutely tweaking the fuck out, as he expects to be able to take on over a thousand Jedi, but is ravaged by just two. Anakin and Obi-Wan, who must have just left the barbershop sporting those fresh-ass Revenge of the Sith cuts. In the rest of the segment, Anakin eats some bugs, they topple another planet's government like it's a normal Tuesday, we see the droid attack on the Wookiees, and then Count Dooku training General Grievous before Lord Sidious gives him a special mission. To kidnap Chancellor Palpatine. Yeah. I know General Grievous and pretty much everyone is in question on whether or not they know that these two motherfuckers are actually the same guy, but I still find it hilarious that Sidious <laughs> essentially put out a hit on himself. 
Just before the end of the episode, Anakin and Obi-Wan get a lead from Palpatine that General Grievous was spotted on another random planet. A complete wild goose chase to set up the eventual endgame of his current scheme. The remainder of the series diverges into two paths that eventually meet back up in the end. The Battle of Coruscant and Anakin's final test. We're going to go through the Battle of Coruscant first and we're going to go through all of it instead of jumping back and forth like the show does. The Separatist army launches an all-out assault on the capital city of the Republic and home of the Jedi Temple, the planet Coruscant. The very same battle from the opening of Revenge of the Sith. A lot of the runtime here is dedicated to a last minute showcase of the action and some of legitimately the coolest shit ever. Mace Windu takes control of an enemy ship by grabbing some wires and <laughs> rides it around like a chariot. We get to see Fordo in his phase 2 armor, single handedly holding his fucking ground before getting reinforced by Yoda. And of course, my personal favorite part. This Jedi general by the name of Sase Tin, Sase Tin, Sase Tin, am I saying that right? I don't fucking know. He is in command of the Space Forces, lands in one of their vendor class starships, and is immediately informed that the ship is damaged and as good as lost. They angle the ship sideways and on a direct course to pass over an enemy ship. Then him and his spacesuit equipped troops fucking jump out onto the enemy ship, breaking in and taking it over. By this time, Mace and Yoda are becoming suspicious of this whole thing. The enemy isn't targeting anything of note. It's almost like a distraction for something. On the other side of the city, a group of Jedi led by Shakti are sent to protect the Chancellor, who is just calmly sipping on a cappuccino or something. He probably has a fucking Keurig in his office. <laughs> he would. Oh yeah, and also escort him away from the literal war zone. But he doesn't really feel like it. Then our favorite little guy shows up. A very long but absolutely thrilling chase scene then ensues, which of course does end with the capture of the Chancellor. But before Grievous is able to get away entirely, Mace Windu takes his chance to force crush the fuck out of his chest in a brutal display. Which was meant to be the original reason for his nasty ass cough and weaker demeanor in the upcoming film. <laughs> I found that so fucking cool as a kid. Holy shit. Okay, now on to what Anakin and Obi-Wan were balls deep into during all this. Upon landing on this cold and snowy planet, they are attacked by this monster, and Anakin, without a second thought, guts it like a fish. Much to the dismay of this indigenous group who were tracking it. After going back with them to their village, they see that there are only women and children there. There is something taking over their land, and all the men, one after one, have left to fight it, but none have succeeded or even returned. The oldest villager then immediately begins reading one of their legends, prophesizing a stranger with a ghost hand who will save them. Obi-Wan then volunteers Anakin because of his missing hand, seeing it as fate. The Force is giving him his test of spirit after all. These leeches are placed on his body, which leave behind these blue marks, and Anakin tells Obi-Wan he won't fail him. Obi-Wan only replies with, don't fail yourself. Anakin, still completely shirtless and most definitely at risk of hypothermia, then journeys long and hard before finding himself in a cave. On the walls are cave paintings telling the whole legend of the tribe. There is once a dark force that attacked. A noble warrior stepped up to defeat the beast and lost his hand in the process. He now finds a powerful ghost hand now takes its place. He uses it to protect his friends and loved ones, but in his pursuit of power, he becomes the very monster he set out to destroy. A perfect mirror of Anakin's own path and future, garnished with a little on-the-nose vision of Darth Vader. This cave also does lead him to the problem plaguing the people of this planet, a mining base controlled by the Separatist-aligned Techno-Union. There's even a bit of an easter egg here implying that at least in this continuity, they were the ones to give General Grievous his modifications. Anakin makes the shocking discovery inside that the village men were all captured and experimented on to create a monstrous army of soldiers. 
Luckily, they are not too far gone, and after simply removing the technology on them, they regain control of themselves, now completely liberated from their cruel captors. At the expense of his robot hand, Anakin then destroys the crystal powering the facility, which thaws out the village's lake and stops the violent snowstorm. Even without a hand, he still cleans out the rest of the Techno Union guys, and they all return to the village. Although the men are so bloated and disfigured now, they are still accepted back into the community with loving arms. In the final moments of this series, Anakin replaces his robot hand, and they are informed of the battle on Coruscant, which leads seamlessly into the opening of Episode 6 of the Star Wars Saga. Nowadays, I think it's really easy for people to write this show off as not much anymore. After all, it's no longer canon, and there's another much more extensive series based on the same thing. But I think just completely dismissing this series as a whole is it's just fucking criminal. The action and animation is insanely good. Like, it's basically worth watching just for that. There's also the pure ambition that went into it. Animation is not easy, far from it. And to plan out, hand draw, animate, and release all of this, all within the less than two years they had to do so, is <laughs> insanely impressive. Especially considering the sheer scale, complexity, and overall quality of the finished product. And of course, we have to talk about just how ahead of its time this was from a Star Wars lore perspective. So much of the DNA of the other Clone Wars show dates back right here. Nearly all the character designs were based off these ones, although obviously tweaked and translated to 3D, of course. Hell, one of, if not the most beloved clone to ever exist, Captain Rex, is at least heavily inspired by Fordo. I haven't confirmed if this is 100% true or if it's just a fucked up game of telephone, but many sources run with the story that Fordo was planned to make the jump, but was later turned into Rex. I honestly <laughs> wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I'm 99% sure that that happened to Dirge, who, side note, is actually somewhat canon now, I guess? But instead of making his reappearance in the 2008 Clone Wars series, he was instead changed to one of my absolute favorite Star Wars characters of all time, Cad Bane. A pretty common sentiment that I've heard over the years regarding this show is that it kind of just set the stage for all the amazing things that happened later. Which deservedly is meant to praise the other Clone Wars series, but also kind of discredits this one. I don't think that Gendy walked so Filoni could run. I think it's more like Gendy fucking sprinted so Filoni could sprint after him. Resulting in two absolutely amazing Star Wars cartoons. But only one of them not only introduced me to my favorite era in Star Wars, but also to a path that led me to discovering my favorite show of all time and a lifelong love for the art of animation. And despite any minor or major plot holes anyone wants to bring up, in my heart at least, it will always be canon. To me. I want to thank you so much for watching. It really means the most to me. This was a pretty massive undertaking of a video to make and a personal dream project of mine. So I really hope that you enjoyed it and I'm so happy to have been able to share it with you. If you're a fan of Star Wars or animation in general and you for whatever reason haven't seen this series, I recommend it with all my heart. Even after watching this whole video, there is still an endless amount that you'll get from watching it or re-watching it. Trust me. If you did like this video and you're looking for something similar, definitely go check out my other review recap style videos. Especially my one on Season 2 of Gendy Tartakovsky's Primal. That one's one of my personal favorites. There's also a ton of other stuff on the channel. I do quite the variety here. But that's all I got for today. I hope you have an absolutely amazing day, and I'll see you in the next one. I want some cheeseburgers just to eat. I'm talking get your my nigga must sit on the beat. You gotta put a lot of ladies beats. Because I like to have a lot of beef. I remember eating outside with my whole team. Now a nigga gotta stay home cause of corn.